evening, everybody. It's we forum that comes to you all to this panel discussion with the eminent panelists. This is a uh, educational initiative of Biomedi. I would request Mr. Sachin Talan to start the session. And a very uh, warm, well, a very uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Deshna. A uh, very warm, warm welcome to everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, to invite uh, all the eminent speakers, Dr. Yatin Mehta, Dr. Asif Iqbal, uh, Dr. Arindam Kar, Dr. Tadu Singhal, and Dr. Pawan Kumar Reddy for this session. Uh, uh, we have Dr. Tanu Singhal. She will be joining sometime later. But uh, yeah, right now we have all the speakers. And Dr. Arindam Kar is going to be the uh, moderating this uh, session. And uh, it's a pleasure for BioVideo to host this session to uh, have all these speakers uh, uh, discuss about the current challenges in uh, uh, in uh, critical care uh, uh, decision making. So I would I would uh, I would invite uh, Dr. Arindam Kar to take over the session. Thank you very much. Good evening, sir. everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Sachin ji, for your kind introduction. So. Good evening, everyone, and my respect to Dr. Yati Mehta, sir, who had been my teacher and uh, the past president of uh, almost all the important societies, including ISCCM, and with the huge experience, I think unmatched experience in it. Then I have two of my good friends, Dr. Pawan Kumar Reddy from Hyderabad and Dr. Asif Rigwal from Kolkata and Dr. Tanu Singhal, who would be joining pretty soon. So I think we have chosen in such a way that the entire north, south, east, west uh, of the country is represented. And uh, I would wish this uh, panel discussion actually helps and uh, drives a quite an important message to all the viewers who are listening or, or viewing it. Uh, and uh, the panel discussion as it would go, it would be an open session, right? And, and it would be more of a, a free flow and all the panelists are are rather encouraged to uh, put their viewpoints or their contributions to every and any and every question. So I would direct one question to one individual panelist to start with, but uh, the others are, uh, please feel free to give your opinion. Uh, so I would start with that, that this is the clinical utility of syndromic testing in, in critical care setting. So uh, for our viewers, so I will ask Mehta sir, that what 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 do you mean by a syndromic testing, sir? So it's a new term or a terminology or point term. So for our viewers' understanding, what do you actually mean by a syndromic testing, sir? See, in very uh, Dr. Carr, in the very simplistic terms, when you normally see a patient with sepsis, and you send all the sort of cultures and try to figure out what the patient has. And it takes 48 hours for the cultures to come back. By that time, many of our patients uh, may not make it or maybe get worse or may go into multi-organ failure. Now, syndromic testing is basically you focus on one particular system. You Clinically, obviously, as clinicians, we see a patient, we know what is the source of the sepsis. You do not know the organism, but you know what is the source. Now, what is the organ which is affected? I mean, is it a... Uh, is it a pneumonia or is it a, a CNS infection or is it a UTI or is it intra-abdominal sepsis or is it skin and soft tissue? These are the normal things which you see or is it bacteremia, whatever. So right. I think once we identified which system you're looking at and you send that particular sample um, for a, a gene-based uh, report on what it is, I think it, it will focus uh, specifically or that particular system, and it gives you a report very soon. Within four hours, we have the report. And instead of waiting for 48 hours for the actual cultures to come, I think it, this has really revolutionized the therapy of the patients, instead of, of sick patients in the intensive care unit. Uh, instead of wasting for 48 hours, you are able to give appropriate antibiotics or whatever other agents you need to give. And you can zero in on whatever the causative organism is instead of giving a broad spectrum of three antibiotics. If you look at the INDICAP study, uh, in the, I mean, yes, more than 60% of the patients were on two antibiotics, and about 30% of the patients were on three antibiotics. Obviously, they were all not appropriate. Patient came into the uh, hospital, he may get a hospital-acquired infection later on, 
uh, with multiple right, bugs. Sir. But otherwise, he has not come into the hospital with multiple bugs. He would have only probably one bug which is causing the uh, uh, infection. So I think it is not only does it help you in diagnosing quickly, it also helps you as you are well all, well aware that every hour delay of inappropriate therapy or uh, right, uh, will increase the mortality by about 8%. I mean, so right, uh, multiple papers have shown that. Not only that, we are also concerned usually in India about MDR organisms. Most, most of us in tertiary care hospitals get patients from other hospitals who have already right, received some inappropriate antibiotic therapy. They may be having CREs or they may be having MRSA, which are all now significant, very significant uh, problems in India. So you may be instead of wasting time, either you waste time by not giving appropriate antibiotics, and you'll give a carbapenem for 48 hours. By that time, the report will come. If it is carbapenem is producing organism, the patient would have probably succumbed or would have got worse. Uh, if you give cholestin from the beginning, I mean, it is inappropriate because you are increasing the incidence of inappropriate antibiotics and anti MDR. Will Maybe we would be overdoing it. So not only pinpointing so, uh, the diagnosis, but we are also helping in the therapeutics and, and maybe aiding our stewardship policy. Absolutely. Yeah. Right, right, sir. Uh, Dr. Pavan, uh, quick comment. Yeah, I think uh, we have been uh, diagnosed. If you go and look in critical care, a lot of things which we are clubbing them as syndrome. For example, we say ARDS, uh, a syndrome. If a, right. The symptoms we are putting together and saying them as a syndrome. So like Dr. Yatin said, you would club something and say this is a pneumonia. Then we define it as a community acquired, as a hospital acquired, as a ventilator associated, what sort. So we club them into some syndrome. Then we say tropical fever. We don't know what tropical fever is it. So our it's a starting point to look about the pathogen. For example, when we say tropical fever, we know it's, it, it encompasses malaria, scrub, lepto, whatnot, dengue, everything. So we say, we put them all together in a syndrome or in a group of a bunch of diagnosis and put them together. So I think in that sense, yes, the syndromic testing is you kind of establish where the source is or what sort of a diagnosis it is, and then work up for that. So rather than sending pan cultures every time, you're like right. trying to pick up particular source or particular syndrome and say, yeah, like we had toxicology, we have anything else. We say they are syndromes, we put club them into syndromes. So your working diagnosis starts off, it's a starting point of saying some diagnosis, rather than individually, you know, if you want less say tropical fever, you would send different, different things, dengue, scrub, malaria, typhoid, hepatitis A, which one is it? So instead of sending them all, if you have one panel where which will pick up all these genes, simultaneously in a multiplex PCR kind, you may send them as a panel, and then you will establish a diagnosis with one single test without much delay, because we know, some tests take three, four days, some take this one more week. So something like that. So I think working syndromology, where you are testing for a lot of different diagnoses or different pathogens on a single platform, uh, where we'll get the answer faster before without waiting one after two. So it, it, we, we can summarize it in that way. It's an age-old clinical excellence where according to the signs and symptoms, you are focusing your search towards a particular uh, area and keeping in mind a particular organism and rather than just uh, 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 ordering a barrage of tests, right, maybe a singular or one or two tests, which gives you multiple panels or multiple organisms within a certain fixed period of time. So not only you save time, you save some money also. And uh, most importantly, your decision is quite quick. Uh, Asif, your quick comment. To actually uh, already discuss everything, I want to say that uh, we know that there are various organisms which particularly affect for community acquired pneumonia or hospital acquired pneumonia. So we can identify early and also important thing that we are getting gene also because uh, culture sensitivity report has come later on. But if you know the gene, particularly gene, then uh, it is very easier to uh, pinpointing the antibiotic as Dr. Mehta said, that uh, it is also save time and save uh, life and also save cost. I, I would uh, rather say these things, this statement for biopair. Uh, Mehta sir, uh, in, in what are the main circumstances that you would be tempted to use the multipanel or the multiplex PCR assay or any of these rapid diagnostics? Which are the approved see, uh, indications? See, for the 
I mean, at the moment, I'm using for uh, uh, three panels we are using. Pneumonia panel is the commonest one which I use. Because okay. it immediately within four hours, I mean, by the time my round in the other ICU finishes, I know the report and I know which uh, antibiotic to give or to de-escalate. Now, this Thanks, is sir. where I would like to emphasize that the, Thanks, once sir. you use this, uh, 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 this technology, I think it is very important that you de-escalate. If you've got a gram-negative organism, then please do not continue with gram-positive antibiotic cover. Because thinking it is why to disturb the apple cart. So then the whole thing goes out of the window if you're not using it properly. Right, sir. You must right, sir. believe in what you're saying. See, so if something, it is showing some genes, that means it is present, then you have to decide whether it is significant or not. Because sometimes right, you sir. do get, it is, sensitivity is very high. Sometimes you do... So that means it will definitely pick up because technology so, is in such a way that yeah, it so would That you have to decide that whether the patient has really got that viral infection on top of the bacterial uh, sepsis or whatever. So do, do, but, do you have any question on the specificity, sir? No, I do not have a question about specificity. Right. But again, as Asif has already said, it is very important to identify the gene. Right, of sir. Why the, if the patient is carbapenem resistant, why, what is causing it and which appropriate antibiotic to give you. Do not shoot STODM uh, and Zevisafta to every patient. I mean, this misuse right, once sir. you start using it, we will have nothing right, left, sir. really. And right. again, as uh, uh, Dr. Reddy has mentioned it, that yes, cost would become an issue. But again, if you look at one day of inappropriate multiple antibiotics, it takes care of the cost of the biofire. Obviously, I would like it to become cheaper so I can use it um, uh, more often. But then, right, uh, uh, still, it is worth the use. I mean, also, we are, we are using it for bacterial, I mean, uh, blood cultures also. Blood cultures. Because these are more deadly than, say, pneumonia. I mean, the patient's got a, um, a bacteremia, and he's, uh, I mean, the mortality would be, would be higher, particularly if he's got, suppose, a central line, and if you're expecting a CBC, BSI, then whether the line should come out or not come out, or which antibiotic we which should, which should use, I think it does uh, make sense. And many times I've cut, uh, caught atypical organisms, which I was not expecting at all. I've got a legion and I've got leptospira, which I was not expecting. So I think uh, this can be very, very uh, useful really to us. So you uh, mean to say that the both margin of error and time frame are very, very less. So in that way, whether this um, multiplex assays can give the pinpointed diagnosis along with the mechanism of resistance to some extent, as well, and, and given it in a very short period of time will definitely help us. Uh, uh, Sachin ji, I will come to the, Mr. Sachin, the technical person behind it. What are your approved indications? What are the validated indications that uh, the clinician can use uh, the, the, this, this particular diagnostic tool? So, uh, in case of BioFire, all the panels, they are basically uh, validated on sample types. So, uh, okay. Each of the panel will have a very specific sample type and uh, the US FDA has approved for those sample types basically. So respiratory, it's nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, for right. pneumonia, it will be BAL and uh, sputum. Uh, sp although BAL is an ideal sample because it's um, much more inside and it's much more cleaner sample. Sputum quality check is a must. In case of blood culture, uh, it is a positive. Is, it, is it same for, I will interrupt you. Is it same for your endotracheal aspirate or a mini BAL sample? So minibal is yes, uh, and ET endotracheal aspirate is also acceptable as a sample, but uh, that's fine. I mean, because they are still uh, much more in control. It's but the, the methodology the has to be a little more uh, uh, robust. The methodology yes, yes. of collecting the sample itself. Yes, yes. Because Obviously, there is contamination. The, yeah, contamination yes, yes. has to be much has to be reduced. prevented. Yes. Yeah. I will I quickly come back to uh, Meta sir. Sir, uh, in a pneumonia panel, a lower respiratory tract panel. Uh, whenever you are doing a biofire, are you going for a BAL itself or a mini BAL or ET aspirate? No, see, it is really, I mean, if you look at it from even from culture, now it is not really believed that BAL is superior to uh, mini BAL. Uh, right, uh, appropriately taken that. So you cannot do an unnecessary procedure uh, just to get a, a, a sample. But I have, what I have now started doing uh, in the way that I have started saying that the nurse will not collect the sample, the doctor will collect the sample. That way, the contamination uh, will go down. It is important to have the correct uh, non-contaminated uh, sample for this patient. Sampling, yeah. And yeah. I think well, it is important for the audience to realize that even minibal, it's a, there is a way to do it. 
and they must right, do sir. it appropriately. Most of the people do it inappropriately. Even Baal, if you see, or in the most of the people are not doing the Baal correctly. So if yes. you are doing a bronchoscopy for a, a particular reason, then it is better to have a Baal. Absolutely. You take a Baal sample. Right, but, if, just, but not for the, just for the sample. But a proper for the... sample collection with a lesser invasive or an easier way. I think that's there. Pa Pavan and Asif, do you agree on that? that yes. Point? Yeah, absolutely. We also follow the minimal uh, protocol for biofire, not uh, bronchoscopy for all the cases. Uh, pa Pavan, you have been handling to uh, many ECMO patients and all others. So, would you uh, rely on a ET aspirate or mini bar, or you are more specific to have a bronchoscopy? Uh, I am uh, I'm confident with the way we take mini bar, the system that we have in place. Like Dr. Yatin said, they say that the doctors who are taking it or the trained respiratory therapist who has with us in our team who is taking it. So it is not a sister. So I'm confident with the sample that they're getting it. And so we take a mini bar. If there is a bronchoscopy that is being done, so we collect the sample uh, and then decide whether we were going for a, before taking it, before doing a bar, if we're doing it for any indication for whatever reason for the bronchoscopy is being done. Then we send the cultures and uh, also send for pneumonia panels. So a, a, a proper technique by a trained personnel or a committed person is more important than the, uh, the, the technique that we will be using. Sachinji, you please carry on. You were talking about the blood. So, uh, yes, sir. In, in case of uh, BCID panel, it's the positive blood culture bottle. That is the recommended sample, validated sample. And uh, in case of GI, it's a stool in carryable and medium, which is very important. The transport medium is very important in case of stools. Okay. And any any other sample that it's been validated? I heard that your the bone no, joint no. infections are also yes. The, the bone and joint is uh, still uh, is yet to be launched. Uh, we are uh, we have planning to launch this in uh, next year. So uh, the, the, the this panel is going to be uh, completely new in the Indian market. There is no other product that is available as of now. Right. PCR based platform and uh, it is going to uh, work on synovial fluid basically. And the, what yeah. about the CSF, which we actually had yes. a lot of the important, ME, uh, yeah, the, benefit out of it? Yes, the me meningitis panel, uh, we use the uh, sterile CSF uh, in a sterile container. That's it. I mean, no transport medium, no centrifugation, just clean sterile, uh, sterile uh, container. That's all is required. I will come to Mehta, sir. Sir, Delhi has suffered a lot of meningoencephalitis waves. I think before Corona actually one of the most deadliest waves were the meningo encephalitis. I think late uh, 2008-9, we, we have last had that, that sort of thing. So do you think it has got a good utility if we can identify a CSF uh, or your meningo encephalitis organism within an hour itself? Rignam, you are confusing Delhi with UP. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was like... <laughs> anyway, yeah, so, yeah, obviously, see, meningitis... I mean, it's one of the most serious killers. I mean, you have to start treating it uh, appropriately. And most of the guys give, I mean, whatever you give, you, you give carbapenems, you give vancomycin uh, in high doses and hope that it works. I think you cannot because, again, the delay will not only uh, increase mortality, but also neurological recovery. I mean, how much quality of life and everything can get affected if your uh, inappropriate therapy is being given if your levels in the CSF are not correct. So I think um, uh, it is very important. A meningeal, uh, meningitis panel can be very helpful in, in preventing or attenuating this. Yeah, Pawan and Asif, do you think also that the yield is many a times low because by the time the meningitis patient uh, reaches you at uh, tertiary care hospital, most of the people have already received the one or two doses of antibiotics and then coming to you, which obviously substantially reduces the bacterial yield. Do you think it has gotten... Uh, very uh, advantage, very much of advantage of using this PCR-based techniques. Yeah. yeah, so if I would ask for that. So, yeah, definitely, because the PCR picks up even if there is one copy of the particular bacteria. So if we're talking about that, even if there's a partially treated meningitis, you would be able to pick up the bacteria. Maybe there is a listeria, whether it is a streptococcus, you would pick it up. On a, on a PCR copy, because even you are picking up, even if there is one copy. So sensitivity is high to pick up. So, and the other part is more than the bacterial, I would uh, I would use this advantage in the viral thing. 
where we are getting a lot of paracoviruses nowadays. Now we wouldn't normally think about it. So unnecessary antibiotics, unnecessary antivirus, people will think about any meningitis, people will think HSV first. But then uh, when you look at paracovirus, you will get a lot of different viruses uh, out of the sample and then enterovirus and other viruses. So then you start to stop treating them with unnecessarily. Sometimes the, if you look at the CSF uh, report, you may think maybe it is a listeria going by the age or the patient's risk factors such as alcoholism right. and whatnot. Right. And you will start apicillin, one side, vancomycin is going one side, acetylover is going one side. So a lot of uh, antibiotics will go in for that patient where the patient would not require it when you know that it is a simple uh, virus which will self-limiting viral meningitis. So I think that is something, that is where the advantage of this thing will come in. So I agree, agree. Because, uh, uh, and it is also very difficult to identify organism from the CSF in a conventional method where the PAM and, uh, biofire uh, is, uh, is make easier this PCR technology, it make easier. And also that uh, says is partially treated bacteria which will not grow in the culture, but uh, they can easily identify by their gene. And also as you told, uh as uh, spoken by Dr. Pawan, actually, that even uh, one or two copies of the bacteria, virus, or fungi may be picked up by the PCR bacteria. And we have to take it in a because CSF is a sterile site. Yeah, the, the, the meninges are a sterile site. So the less chances of contamination if you have, if you have done it properly in, in that way. Uh, any experience, uh, Pawan, with the cryptococcus, whether it had helped you? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we we had one patient who had this meningitis we sent off and it was a bouncer. It, it showed cryptococcus and then we retrospectively realized that patient is HIV positive. Now, most of the times we don't uh, send off. Sometimes it is, it's not routine in our practice to send off retroviral or screening for other viruses unless there is some procedure like dialysis on them. So if the patient otherwise uh, is clinically not fitting unless or you have a strong suspicion that the patient has it, we would usually send otherwise. A patient with just coming with meningitis, uh, some history of uh, a prolonged altered sensorium, uh, we went ahead and did it, and we found cryptococcus in that. So it was something like this, bounces come in. So I think this is where the, uh, the, these things will help. Uh, Sachinji, uh, uh, do your CSF panel cover most of the common and uncommon organisms, particularly the different viruses and fungi? Yes, yes. I mean, there are there are certain gaps that we are aware of, sir. Uh, like, uh, for example, JE and TB, and there has been a demand for these targets to be included in ME panel. But uh, right. unfortunately, these are challenging targets. And uh, uh, although R&D team is working on it, but I we, we won't have any date or any uh, comment on that uh, as of now. But besides uh, Japanese encephalitis and tuberculosis, most of the other organisms yes. which can be implicated into in India itself, those are covered. Yes, so yes, yes. Okay, coming yes, back yes. to the respiratory panel, right? Pavan, in your practice, which has given you more advantage in your clinical decision making, the upper respiratory or a lower respiratory tract? Because when it was launched, if I'm not, correct me if I'm wrong, Sachinji, that it was launched mostly in the upper respiratory we started, right? Lower respiratory took some time to be validated, right? But we started yes, yes. with the upper respiratory tract sampling. Uh, Pavanji, your experience on both. Uh, both of them have their own uh, advantages and uh, issues because not all pneumonia patients have a productive cough. They can't expect a rate. They don't have a sputum out. So you see a pneumonia brewing there. Uh, we recently have one patient now, an asthmatic who came with a pneumonia. And now when you try to look at the reports, it looks a lower pneumonia classical on the CT, but uh, when you look at the counts and all, it looks like a viral because the lymphocytes are up the core total counts are normal, but she's an asthmatic, she's well wheezing, so you end up starting antibiotics. But when you send a sample, uh, human metanumovirus comes out. So you know that, uh, yes, human metanumovirus can present in different forms. You can see a pneumonia, you can see a pleurisy, you effusions and stuff. So these things will help you in actually, uh, you know, understanding the process, understanding the pathogen will be better, and then stop your antibiotics, which might be going unnecessarily. And uh, we can be rest assured that, yes, this is something that is self-limiting, which is not something to be treated with antibiotics unnecessarily. And then in the times of COVID, everything is COVID now. When you see a CT, people will say it is COVID. So 
you see radiologists reporting CT severity score for everything which is non-COVID, also, which is typical lobar pneumonia. But then when somebody does it in a periphery or some other center, they will report it as Corad 4, Corad 5, and then put a CT severity and send. And it scares the daylights of patients that it is COVID and they come in. And we are seeing now, now um, in Hyderabad, we are seeing a lot of influenza. We are seeing uh, influenza H1, H3, all sorts of influenza now, metanumoviruses, all these things are coming in. So, and even like you said, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 is also picked up. Sometimes we don't pick it up, the SARS-CoV-2, the regular RT-PCR, because you have a cut limiter of cycle threshold. So you have a 35 right. cycle threshold, but this is more sensitive because you are only, there is no cutoff for this. So even if there is one or two, Fragments or PCR copies or some. It will, it will, it will definitely it will pick, pick up. up. It will pick up. I, so, I, will, I will come to a little technical question to Sachinji. So, yeah. uh, as as uh, Dr. Pawan is saying, that now you have included SARS CoV 2 in your upper respiratory tract panel, right? Yes. And all the influencers, the, the yes. endemic influencers too. Yes, yes. And uh, are the, are the deadlier other coronavirus like? Uh, the MERS and all others went through. Those so are also MERS, included. So no, MERS is going to be included. So right now the panel that we have is the RP 2.1 and uh, we are going to have an upgrade uh, from RP 2.1 to RP 2.1 plus, which will also have the MERS uh, in, included in it. So and this then, is a, then, yeah, please. this is go going on eventually. I mean, uh, in a sequence. So right now the panel that we are using is the US uh, panel. Uh, and uh, eventually, we are going to be using the MERS uh, panel as well. Okay, and it, obviously, it includes the RSV2. Yes, yes. And, yes. and some and, of the atypical bacteria also. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, just, uh, just uh, for uh, in the information of the of, of everyone, uh, the BioFire uh, upper respiratory panel was the first uh, panel that was USFD approved. Full, I mean, complete USFD approval, not the emergency uh, use approval, but a complete uh, USFD approval. The DNO approval, this, that was the only one that was available in the market. So uh, I would come back to uh, Pawanji is that uh, that means a patient who is coming with a, uh, uh, with a symptom of uh, the influenza like illness or whatever, the classical on that part. And now that we have the uh, multiple possibilities, not only COVID itself, right, when the flu season have kicked in, right, and particularly in, in, in maybe in a, a pediatric age group also, or in a very elderly immunocompromised patients. So a quick differentiation between a COVID and non-COVID will help in, in many ways, right? I, I think you agree on that. Not only treatment, but also triaging and, and disposition of the patient and all that. Yes. Please carry on. Yeah, yeah definitely. I think, uh, uh, first of all, it allays a lot of fears for the patients and families. Um, once you say that, you see, now we have become experts at reading CTs. Uh, and we could clearly say this is not covered, but sometimes influenza kind of, when advanced influenza also comes out in similar kind of uh, interstitial pneumonias. But then COVID, everybody is uh, expert now in reading the CTs and GGOs and picks up uh, even the uh, smallest ones. But then, yeah, when the periphery, when they report on the CT, it's, it's scary for the families, it's scary for the patients because they report the CT severity 8 by 25, 12 by 25 for a regular pneumonia also. So when you look at it and say that this doesn't look like COVID, definitely on the CT. Um, but at the same time, you, uh, you send off a sample, you will pick up also which, which virus it is so that uh, you can also be kind of reassuring for you that if you can pick up, if anything comes out, it is fine. If it doesn't come out, then it's a different thing altogether. But then uh, if anything comes out of it and then you can uh, focus on it and say, yeah, this looks like influenza, this matches. Now it is because your treatment also changed. Uh, you would go for Rosaltamab for an influenza service, uh, going for some other antivirals or sometimes going to expensive therapy like monoclonal antibodies, which has become a rage nowadays. So everybody is asking those kind of questions. The family keeps asking, you should be, you should be looking at this and that. So because this report comes faster, you send off the sample, you get the sample report. So you have a quicker answer to hmm. the, uh, your uh, barrage of the queries itself. As if you're experienced in Kolkata. Because you have yeah. been managing the, one of the yeah, biggest I'm hospitals. The, yeah. And, uh, and, and a speed is specific, yeah. I see. Yeah. So uh, this biofair make our life very easy. As uh, Dr. Uh, Pravin said, 
that uh, sometimes the patient come with CVNAT negative. Since uh, it's looking the viral infection, we have uh, found two, three cases where uh, uh, the incomprehensive panel, the COVID uh, positive. So uh, in, uh, uh, and also we uh, found some atypical vi uh, virus like a metanemovirus and also atypical mycobacteria, mycoplasma we often found and it's health influenza typing also because uh, 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 because influenza b and uh, a3 and sometimes it is not uh, needed uh, 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 treatment also for uh, this thing so if you have a biofire report uh, your confidence will be better to treat the patient and also helping the isolate the patient uh, Sachinji, uh, one thing I always had in mind that one is not only the contamination, but is it too sensitive at times to pick up uh, the organism? Maybe this is a remote infection that we are dealing with, right? May not be a viable organism still in the, in the body itself, but by a fire picking it up. So how to deal with it? Sachinji, uh, yeah, just a second. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can you can you repeat the question? Actually, uh, there was some uh, technical issue yeah, in my. Yeah, I, I said that uh, the the common perception um, amongst many of the users is that it is too much sensitive, right? At times, at times it may be baffling. It may be uh, sort of uh, uh, giving two three organisms positive, or whether uh, we are not sure whether there is a viable organism or a continued infection being happening. So how to deal with that? How to interpret the proper result? Yes, uh, that's a very uh, a very uh, uh, apt apprehension actually. Uh, we need to understand that it's a PCR test and PCR cannot differentiate between dead and live organisms. If the nucleic acid is there, it is going to detect it. It is going to amplify and it is going to give the signal. So uh, here, uh, the, the, the most important part will be of the, of the consulting microbiologist who is going to be reviewing those reports and uh, they have to, because even in uh, normal uh, practice, they, they, they uh, usually, uh, they will decide which, which organisms to report and which ones to not, depending on the hospital uh, flora and uh, antibiograms and everything. So based on that, uh, these decision making are very, very important uh, and this, which is, which is very true for biofire as well. But your, your system is very unforgiving. If it is there, it would report. Right, because yes. most of the all the reports are automated. So I yes. think uh, the the that the the message that you are putting through is that the clinician has to have a discussion a, a discussion yes. with an ID specialist and a microbiologist, and then our yes. clinical uh, experience will chip in to decide yes. about it. Pawan, how do yes. you deal with it? Many a times you are not expecting, but it's there. See, I think that is where uh, we come into the picture, isn't it? Uh, that is where we, we are there for. Otherwise, it becomes an office-based practice where a technician is sending the sample and the technician will treat it based on the report that comes right. to it. Where, where so, we are actually valued. Yeah, that is where your value comes in as a doctor because you become... Uh, that is why artificial intelligence cannot completely replace you there. That is where uh, you come to the picture. Uh, the picture is of a clinician as a clinically taking the, all the info around it and then applying it to the practice. Yes. So you are utilizing these steps for the sake of gathering information to help you aid in the diagnosis and the treatment. So it is not that you're going to blindly treat it. See, majority of the time we send ET cultures, we send off the pneumonia panels, you may get candida in that, you may get enterococcus in that. doesn't mean that you're going to chase that and treat uh, candida when the culture grows, uh, ET cultures grows candida. So you need to understand those things, which grows, which is not, which is uh, uh, focal to, which is not uh, area, which is not to that particular site to cause an infection. Based on that, you have to treat. You have to use your clinical judgment. That's what is important. So I think we get multiple times, uh, multiple organisms sometimes based on. But nowadays, I think the, the, the pneumonia panel at least will give you the, co the counts in a semi-quantitative way. Uh, but the uh, the respiratory panel that is there, the upper respiratory panel will not give you the copies, the number of copies. But definitely in that sense, you may discuss uh, about the microbiologist about whether you think there's a strong uh, heavy band that's coming in. 
But for the pneumonia panel, at least it gives you the copies, the number of copies that you're seeing, and also associated AMR patterns. So you get those things and then understand that picture. That's why clinician is a must. Well, uh, as if I will come to an, uh, a different question, though. Right. So we all know it is. Uh, it saves our time. It gives a precise, very sensitive test, uh, and the specificity is quite high. But you may not differentiate between a live or a dead organism itself, be it anywhere. But uh, do you, uh, uh, a, a lot of feedbacks that have come, uh, many people are actually combining a rapid and conventional test, right? So the rapid gives you an idea in the initial hours so that you can initiate the process. And maybe the conventional uh, test, if comes positive, right, it, it validates your rapid test also, uh, reinforces your decision. The, do you think uh, the, this is this should be a good practice, or it would be a, a wastage of the resources, or a more expensive way of treating things? No, actually, uh, for me, we we do both uh, the rapid test and the conventional. So, uh, because uh, there is a, a biasness of the if the dead uh, uh, bacterial or dead virus copy is there it will picked up and sometimes it give multiple reports. Like uh, last uh, last week, we also get one of the minister admitted here and he has a uh, uh, the bell sample uh, showing that Acinetobacter, Klebsiella and also Enterococci. Now, whom I will treat? So yeah. Acinetobacter is not sparing your West Bengal ministers. That's what they are <laughs> afraid of. <laughs> so... So, uh, so that's why we are, man, uh, when we send the biofab to getting the idea and also we send the conventional culture also and uh, within 48 hours, the, uh, it will give you the most uh, precious uh, diagnosis for uh, whom you, you will treat. So that's... Uh, uh, Bhavanji, your, your, your practice. Yeah. yeah My we practice do say yeah, we do send both of them. See, the, this doesn't mean that all the time you're going to get anything out of both of them. Sometimes you may not get anything out of the both if it's a viral pneumonia. Um, because especially when you're talking about pneumonia panel, we are more focused on the regular pneumonia or atypicals uh, rather than viral. The respiratory pathogen panel, yes, definitely the throat swab, definitely it shows more of viral and atypical bugs, which will never grow in your culture. For example, mycoplasma, legionella, chlamydia, these are not going to grow up in your culture. They're not so easy to pick right, up. Even right. streptococcus. Streptococcus also, you're not going to pick up most of the times in your culture. If you, so, if you remember, Pavan, when we started, there was an urinary legionella antigen, which yes, took almost yes. seven to 10 days to come, right? So by yes, that time, yes. your fate is decided. Yes. So this is something that uh, most of the times, you know, it, it will help you in those particular subset of things. So if, if you are in that correct path and you get that report, yeah, you can substantiate it and say, three, I send this. Uh, I had a hemolysis going on with the pneumonia. You suspect there is a mycoplasma going on. You build up in the indirect illness going up. You suspect and you, you tell your residents, you know, ah, it will come mycoplasma, send a sample. And you'll, you'll validate yourself, yes, like I said. Now, I, I, I would be asking Sachinji, so what yeah. is your, your take on this? Is it an Indian practice or it's a global accepted practice or you should encourage this or you should discourage because it's it's there in front of it's, it's a, almost a doubling of the resource utilization what do you think i mean it will be very difficult for me to comment on that actually right now uh, and and now this because uh, the advantages are in in both ways but i think it is not a, it's a quite a practical solution, particularly in where the margin of error is quite uh, uh, quite low, right? Then yes. in those cases, we can have uh, the benefit. We can reap the benefit of both the processes. Yes. The, so, ac uh, according to one us, and the conventional one. Yeah, please. According so, to please. Us, the syndromic testing is to be used uh, uh, very... Uh, in the right cases, I mean, uh, the right, uh, the, it, it is, it will be the clinician's prerogative to, to select the right case for the syndromic testing. It, uh, I mean, we, we also worry sometimes that if this uh, testing is misused or uh, used uh, where it's not supposed to be, then uh, the value of this uh, valuable test will be lost. 
and uh, that is that is where the major importance is to to choose the right case to 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 justify the cost benefit and the benefit ratio and uh, to use it wisely so that uh, the patient care is the best uh, uh, with the with patient care in mind ultimately and uh, that is that is what we would uh, recommend ultimately and maybe also where uh, a lot of decisions has to be taken Absolutely. it is not that you have already decided to do this and you are just doing the test so not yes. only in the right patient but in a situation where your decision would be altered the decisions making would be altered by the outcome of the result of the uh, outcome of the test itself yes. okay i will everywhere the time is of essence yeah obviously the time, the is, time of is of essence and here you can name. but i would come to a, a more a uh, complex question i will start with dr pawan is that uh, do you think this could be also a uh, very much uh, helpful but yet underutilized in your hospital acquired infections where the prevalence of mdros are, are are very very high right in in, in uh, cutting across india in any hospital yes. so do you think the rapid test would be better to identify the mdros the the resistance mechanism and help us to choose the proper one rather than bombarding with all the restricted antibodies put together i think uh, yes definitely uh, because majority of the hospitals now we have bigger problem with klebsiella we all know it is mdr uh, you know if a klebsiella grows in your hospital you know what to treat it with but um, majority of the time what happens after the klebsiella is treated the patient second next infection will come uh, different bug will come you start looking at proteas once you start colistin and treat patients with colistin the next uh, after meropenem colistin the next bugs would be seracea protea stenotrophum monas barcoldaria and what not and these things are fastidious they don't grow so fast in the et tract so it takes time unless the growth is too heavy so i think uh, this regularly you have your samples pick up majority of the time if there is any seracea they'll pick up if there is any acid about it picks up e coli klebsiella like everything all these drugs and the other part is that mdr definitely like you said mdro we also know the genetic structure whether it's a vim whether it's an imp it's an ndm it's oxa 48 you will you will also take some you will pick it up so if you know there's an oxa 48 yes you will look probably to add septaminophen to solve that or if the if you think there is an indium predominantly is there an indium growing then you would not think much about it you would think about probably adding astronum so definitely it will help you in treating appropriately early and try not to because sometimes you start off looking at the procastin and people were looking at procastin we know that pneumonia and other stuff where the procastin may not drive as much as you expect it to be so looking at it and say the procal is negative the patient has got a pneumonia i treated with colistin maybe now it is time for me to start a gram positive maybe i have to start something like linozolar for treating any gram positive infection what are which gram positive are looking at unless if your hospital is teamed with mrsa uh, not looking at enterococcus to cause a pneumonia there so which one are you looking for so uh, it's, it becomes a fashion everybody starts studying mrsa coverage beyond a certain point of time if it is uh, very sparse in your hospital you should not be thinking about it but then these mdros will help you in picking up the resistance patterns will help you in picking up uh, will guide you the definitely the therapy and the et culture would have definitely sent and i think that would validate your that you were on the right track as if your take uh, no actually, actually sir said uh, same i am mean, very uh, enlightened very really, uh, broadly and thing is that uh, he, it saved the time and also the secondary uh, uh, the after treating uh, this uh, opportunistic infection or other say uh, this thing pick up early and uh, the decision making will be helpful yes uh, what is the global practice sachin ji is uh, the rapid diagnostics are now integrated in your uh, stewardship policies globally uh, well the indian uh, healthcare scenario and the global healthcare scenario is totally different i mean globally there is government reimbursements and uh, the whole focus is uh, on uh, reduction of length of stay for patients because they want a higher turnaround time and that's why they prefer using rapid tests uh, rapid syndromic tests is like uh, the first line of test in almost uh, all these developed countries but in india as our healthcare system is so fragmented and uh, it's out of the pocket uh, 
payment. So that is where the challenge uh, lies, actually. But I think eventually, right? It's a it's a one time cost versus your indirect cost when your yes. actually length of stay goes up or your number of antibiotics being used are more rather than focusing on one singular test, which can reduce all those things. So I think the, the way we look at it, right? We will only look at the tangible thing. That, okay, I'm using X amount of money for one single test, but maybe we should emphasize that this one single test is actually saving a lot of money if actually properly interpreted and also acted upon. So I think that that part is very, very important for uh, and, and all of us. And I will come to Sachinji once again. Uh, do you think one of the advantages is that uh, you do not require much of a uh, sophisticated uh, uh, sort of setup to do all these things? What is your, your take? Can yes. many of the hospitals without the biosafety level requirement and others, they can also accept this one and, and, and start doing it? Yes. So conventionally, if we look at it, uh, PCR has been around for decades, but uh, the actual application, uh, clinical application has been limited because of availability of the test. I mean, if we uh, rule out all the metros, then availability of PCR diagnostic test, even today, takes around uh, 72 hours for the results to come. And uh, with biofire sample in result out kind of a platform, uh, it's 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 as simple as a as a child's play. I mean, an eighth standard student without any expertise can also process the sample. Two minutes of hands-on time and the results are out. So it's very simple, no infrastructure requirement. Just uh, place the system on the plug and play, so and ready to use. So and then any requirement on the biosafety level, on the lab requirement. So biosafety level. Yeah, biosafety level is required for sample processing and sample handling because when we are dealing with uh, infectious samples, like say, for example, SARS-CoV-2 samples, then yes, we have to uh, have all the biosafety uh, containment uh, infrastructure to handle or process these samples. But if we talk about, say, uh, uh, any other like a CSF sample or uh, say BCID sample or stool sample, uh, we can we can do it uh, with a with a you know a dead air box in a standard and... lab yeah in a standard yes. lab we can we can yes. do yes. it in a standard lab so I think that is also an advantage that it could be almost like a point of care test right yes so maybe uh, we can say point of hospital test so you can do it in your own hospital and and you can do it anytime because not much of sophistication required in terms of the technicality or or to conduct the test itself it's I have seen that I have in fact. The first, uh, the biofire, I, I was back uh, then in Calcutta. So the Kishore and me, we did that. And we did it by ourselves. And it took uh, the, the learning curve is, is pretty quick, actually. Uh, Pawan, your take, is it, uh, is it a big advantage that it can be done anywhere by anyone? Yeah, definitely. Because we have both a PCR lab also in our hospital. And uh, when you go to the PCR lab, you know how difficult it is. You have to go into small, small rooms that are there. Uh, uh, each is one amplification at one side, sample extraction is one. Uh, every room is different and they go through different, different compartment, different windows, uh, sterilization procedures. And you understand the amount of uh, effort that goes to actually extract a, D, a DNA sample or an RNA sample, DNA sample, and then do genetic testing on each of these to get an actual multiplex PCR. On the, on, compared to that, this is so simple. This is a tabletop instrument. You do a hands-on time is two minutes and you leave it in the machine for 60 minutes and it comes out with a report. So it is, it's very easy. So, and you don't need a lot of space for this. So all those things, I think, uh, great advantages of, and definitely when you look at the sensitivity specificity, when you compare it with any other kit in the market, this has got the better sensitivity specificity on, especially the BCID panel. As if it, it, it saved the time and it saved the, uh, the manpower. If you calculate the manpower hours, it saved the manpower hours also and is easy to do. And I will rather say when we practice for every uh, patient when admitted in my unit, the first test we send the comprehensive respiratory panel it will help to identify the uh, virus or bacterial origin, uh, the origin, and it saved the, uh, uh, the lot of uh, time and we can early uh, treat and early 
transfer the patient from the ICU. So in my hospital, it is always a uh, burden to give the... Uh, so even uh, that decision head. making, you can also yeah. do, right? Whether, whether you can, I told that the disposition of the patient itself. And, and both of you, do you, yeah, both of yeah. you, do you agree that the public perception about the diagnostics, particularly on an infectious disease, has radically changed after COVID? And this could be a little more beneficial for us to push yeah. for rapid diagnosis, particularly the PCR base. Yeah, Absolutely. that is what I think. Yeah, definitely. I think once everybody knows PCR now, so yeah. uh, so everybody understands what is RT PCR. They know PCR, they understand it. It is some sample which will come out, report faster, uh, more sensitive to pick up diagnosis wise. And uh, the more advantage I will uh, say Arindam, about these uh, tests is that, especially the biofire or the telemarine thing is, even in smaller setups, we are always talking about the tertiary care. You have a well established laboratory, you have a good uh, bio microbiologist, biochemist, everybody. But there are smaller centers where you don't have a dedicated clinical microbiologist or a microbiologist or anybody there. Probably you would have a technician who will do the you know, right. cleaning cultures and everything. So there you are, he may not give you the correct input. So you will be chasing him for the cultures and it will take you five days for even reporting. If there is a gram stain, you will not be in a position to do a gram stain also. He will not let you tell you whether it's a gram negative bacteria or not. Or sometimes they're outsourced to another bigger lab. And they're on the phone all the time trying to reach out to them. What happened to our sample? We sent it across. So when you have these kind of equipment in your lab, it helps you out in actually diagnosing faster. And then you are more confident in that report because it's getting done in in-house rather than you are sending it to an outsourced place. So I think it is. Ah, yes. I think. But uh, tell me something about the limitations. Uh, Pawan, you had been uh, telling all the good things. Maybe we discussed some of the part which yeah. which we have uh, sort of provisions to improve, or that we can give a feedback to the industry that this is our clinicians' wish list. So definitely, I think uh, you have to be able to customize the path. Sometimes you can narrow on the diagnosis. Uh, you can you know for sure you have a CVP in front of you. You know the counts. You know the picture on the X-ray. You know it's a a pneumonia of a bacterial origin. So where you don't want to do a viral panel. So you only can do only the bacterial subset of that or which you think is more common there. Now you are not looking at streptococcus when a patient has a, in, in hospital pneumonia, right? So I think uh, you should be able to, to customize to, uh, so, Sorry to interrupt. Is that you want a customized panel? Right? So customized not a fixed definitely. panel, yeah. Yeah, customized yeah, not a fixed I, I, panel, I, I, rather, I, I, yeah. You can talk. choose your panel. Yeah. Yes, I think one thing, when we are uh, treating the cap or uh, the uh, patient coming from the uh, other hospital or uh, community acquired pneumonia, then we can go for the full panel. But when we are suspecting the hospital acquired uh, infection or secondary infection uh, from ICU, then we can uh, we we can uh, separate the the uh, viral is the unnecessary thing. Then uh, we have tried to understanding or uh, try to find out the which bacteria and what the whether MDR or XDR. So uh, that's uh, that's there is requirement of the customized things. If okay, I will I will welcome Tanu, madam, and thanks Hi. for Sorry. even uh, picking up uh, your. From your busy schedule, you have been able to join. Thank you, madam, that you have kept your commitment. Uh, we had been discussing, uh, Dr. Mehta left, uh, and uh, Dr. Pawan and Dr. Asif is there. We have had covered many of the things. I have reserved some of the very uh, unique and technical questions for you. I was waiting for you to join. So to begin with, we were just in, in continuum with the discussion, right? So I asked certain limitations, which uh, Pawan, uh, emphasize that can there be a provision of a more focused panel? Uh, for example, if, if you are looking into community, maybe the most majority, the community-based organisms are in that panel. Or if you are dealing with an MDRO or hospital acquired infection, then, then we can exclude in that particular panel most of the viruses and other. So do you think that would be a good idea? 
So this is about the respiratory panel that we are talking about. Yes, yes, respiratory, respiratory panel. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So um, the the thing is that we can't really have in a, two panels for community acquired and hospital because I think it would be difficult for the manufacturers also to have one and. Basically, if you look at the upper respiratory panel, that is more suited towards community acquired infections yes. because it has yes. the viruses and it has the, um, uh, the atypical organisms. The only it doesn't have streptococcus pneumonia. So, I mean, I would think that if there was a provision that you can actually, or if there are any studies which say that you can run the upper respiratory panel in a sputum sample, that would be ideal for community acquired infections. Um, or something they could add on some things to the upper respiratory panel so that they could make it community acquired. I feel that the lower respiratory panel is not useful at all for nosocomial infections either. Because once a patient has received two or three days of antibiotics and you do the lower respiratory panel on his uh, tracheal secretions, you grow all kinds of bugs maybe two or three of them. And you also have a lot of resistance genes detected, but that doesn't tell you the- um, The etiology. difference between colonization and infection. Infection. Yeah. So even the lower respiratory panel is actually only for people who are coming with community acquired infections. It is of no so value your, for hospital acquired infections. So you are saying uh, uh, on your experience and obviously with uh, the clinical logic, that by the time we are sending the lower respiratory panel in a uh, sort of hospital acquired infection where the patient has typically stayed or overstayed for certain amount of days, that the sample is going to be positive if not polymicrobial. And there's uh, no way we can differentiate between uh, a colonization and an infection itself. And the situation is more worse when we have multiple agents and multiple mechanisms positive. I think that is one limitation problem uh, we should always consider before it. So it's uh, it's more useful than any. But one thought I think uh, Sachinji can clarify, which Madam actually pointed out: Can we use an upper respiratory tract panel with a lower respiratory tract sample? So no matter it was this was your question, right? Yeah, because what happens is that when you do this upper respiratory panel on the nasopharyngeal swab in a patient with pneumonia, you don't know whether it is just a colonization in the nasopharynx or there is actual infection. So if you can do it on the sputum, that might help or an endotracheal aspirate. And we have done it before the lower respiratory panel was available. We sometimes yes, yes. hit the we upper respiratory that, panel yeah. in patients who had come with a severe infection and who were intubated. So we would run the uh, upper respiratory panel with the, with the bal or the sputum, but it is not approved for that, but we were doing it earlier. Because the Sajinji, can we do this? Lower. Right. Uh, so can we do this and can we have the intended benefit that madam is asking for? So as, as ma'am has already mentioned that it's not uh, validated uh, sample type, but uh, uh, so for upper respiratory, it is nasopharyngeal swab. According to the US FDA studies, uh, they have found that the recovery of viral targets is the highest uh, when the sample is collected from the nasopharyngeal region. And uh, the problem with sputum is uh, that there is just a lot of normal flora, and uh, that that will interfere with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with with the results, uh, and that is the reason why the upper respiratory panel has been made in that way. But the gap, uh, as Ma'am has rightly uh, highlighted, Doctor, so uh, this gap has been identified by Biofire, and they are in the in the workings to get a panel which will be using uh, sputum and uh, will be giving upper respiratory uh, targets as well. But okay, it's, so that's, that's a, that's a, that's a good news. Okay. Madam, I would come to you, the usefulness of this rapid diagnostics on, on pediatric population. What is your experience and comment about it? Yes, so, um, so basically, you know, is this only via the respiratory or all the three? The... All, the, all the three, yeah. Okay. You can, so, Take your I mean, sweet time. Yeah. So basically, you know, one is the meningitis panel, I think. We use it right. a lot in children because um, we, in any patient who comes to us with the community acquired meningitis, we, if the CSF shows pleocytosis, we do this because it helps us in picking up pneumococcus and it also helps us in picking up enterovirus, which is a common cause of uh, pediatric aseptic meningitis. 
we also run this panel in patients who have uh, who are immunocompromised because of the because it can help us pick pick up listeria right. as a one of the pathogens though it is not very good for cryptococcus there the antigen test is actually better than this panel so uh, the blind spots however of this panel is the that one is that it is not picking up the tropical viruses which in india is a concern because you see dengue encephalitis you see chikungunya encephalitis which is not picked up again tb is not picked up here so those are the some of the limitations of the panel but anyway it helps us if you prove pneumococcus it helps you if you know that this is a viral pathogen then you can actually take off the antibiotics and send the child home in 2 to 3 days right. so it helps in right. antibiotic stewardship and there have been one or two instances where we have even made a diagnosis of cmv on the basis of this panel in a patient with po where we could not find a cause we had a patient who presented with a encephalitis and we picked up bzv which helped us diagnose um, herpes zoster and varicella zoster yes, well, so it has helped so that is a useful test in, uh, in as far as the re respiratory panel is concerned we mostly use the upper respiratory tract panel in uh, pediatrics because a uh, lot of these especially in immunocompromised children especially like our children who are in the bone marrow transplant unit or cancer chemotherapy patients because there we no want to pick up rsv we want to pick up para influenza we want to pick up influenza and adenovirus and all of these are covered in this upper respiratory panel so we routinely do it in these group of patients and if we find that the patient has rsv we give ivig and ribavirin to the patient if we find that the patient has para influenza we might consider other drugs so it is very useful in immunocompromised children in patients who are uh, coming in with a pneumonia also yes, um, yes. Uh, which what looks like a viral pneumonia we are doing these panel this panel to help us make a diagnosis but we are not using this panel on in, in opd patients who are coming to us with mild infections because though the panel has been widely used in us for antibiotic stewardship because once you pick up a pathogen you don't give antibiotics the cost of the panel does not allow us to do that because opd patient coming with a mild influenza like illness you wouldn't do the panel because the right patient in a right patient at a right setting with keeping in mind the financial implication also would be your aim anything yes. on the stool sample madam stool sample not good for you know outpatients or normal healthy children because there the cost of the panel is huge yeah. so we are doing it only in our immunocompromised population because it is picking up norovirus which is an important concern in our bmt unit it is picking yeah. up clostridium difficile also and it is picking up other pathogens like cyclospora cryptosporidium etc so again the benefit of the stool panel is only in immunocompromised patients not otherwise otherwise if you do it in the community acquired setting now you will pick up three or four things in right. this that is also an, an that again doesn't tell and, you and maybe with the, the with the with the indian bowel system right so you can you can pick up almost anything bhavan your experience on stool uh, samples for rapid diagnostics uh, we haven't done much on the eyes part stool wise you you haven't done much on that part so madam do do you uh, i ask this question to uh, our other panelists and they have agreed but you are uh, leading the the infectious disease team and also you are a policy maker in many of the uh, institutions as well as in the different bodies do you think there is a role of an amalgamation of rapid diagnostics along with an antibiotic stewardship programs would it would it be quite helpful can we use it properly to make our stewardship program a success yes it can see because in the inpatient setting i am not talking about outpatient unless the cost of the panel comes down tremendously we won't be able to do these panels for outpatients but in inpatients it will help in two or three ways see first of all you know when a patient comes let's say with a severe pneumonia to the icu and you haven't made an etiologic diagnosis the tendency of the clinician is to keep using antibiotics escalating antibiotics because the patient doesn't get better but if you demonstrate that this patient has a viral illness you know that what this patient actually needs is supportive care and you are not going to use too many antibiotics in this patient and you will reserve the antibiotics for later if the patient gets a vap 
So clearly, and also a very other important role is that the parents have an answer as to what has happened to the child. Because, you know, most of the times if the child comes very sick and in the ICU and you say the child has pneumonia, but you cannot tell them which is the bacteria or the virus which has caused the pneumonia, they feel lost. But then you can tell them that, look, your child has this, your child has that. So at least the educated people feel a little bit of um, uh, this. So I think in that inpatient setting, the cost of the panel justifies its use. But in the outpatient setting, the cost is too exorbitant. Yeah, the so unless, is... The, unless the cost comes down, we won't be able to use it a lot in the outpatient setting. So Sachinji, this is our wish list. A little bit of uh, consideration of the cost itself. Because I read somewhere is that uh, uh, a publisher, uh, an author was asked in a press conference that why your books are so costly. So he answered because no one reads it. So there's, there's a costly. So once we you start reading it, the cost will come down. So would you I, answer I, in that way? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I just want to give two examples in the past one day. One day itself where your upper respiratory biofire has helped tremendously. So one is this child who was one year old, um, five years old, admitted at another hospital with fever and cough. And he came in very sick. He had low WBC counts of 1900, low platelets, high SGOT, high SGPT. And this child was being investigated for all dengue, everything came negative. And uh, the child had a lot of cough. So the family, the family came to me because the diagnosis was not being made. So we said that, okay, we will do just one test because to me, it looks like a respiratory viral infection. So let us do one test and see what's there. So we asked for an upper respiratory biofire and it picked up influenza. So the moment we showed that this is influenza, because the doctor who was treating the patient thought that how can you have influenza with a count of 1500 with an SGOT of 1000, but we know influenza can do it. Yes, so the yes, can be a, a was made, All antibiotics have been stopped and the child is just on specific influenza treatment and the parents are also at rest. Second, we had one patient, adult, who's 30, 42 years old, who was having fever for the past four days. High fever, many people in his office are sick. So this patient had normal counts. Everything was negative. COVID was negative. So they went and did a PCR for RSV, for influenza and enterovirus through some different indigenous panel. Right. And that came negative. So this patient now is running high fever for four days and we don't know what he has. So he came to our hospital for admission yesterday. So I basically told him that, look, we are still suspecting that you have a respiratory viral infection. And right now it's mainly flu and RSV, which is going around. I don't know why this panel came negative, but we want to run your uh, test again on a, a approved panel. Okay. So we did the upper respiratory biofire and low what influenza B is positive. The moment we got it positive, the patient's anxiety went away. We started specific flu treatment and we stopped investigating for other things. So what I mean to say is that if you have a, what you, if you have a good panel, and which is which works well. And our respirate, our experience with the upper respiratory has been very good. I mean, when we think of something, it really picks it up. Then the cost is offset by the advantages because then you stop investigating for other things. So whatever money you would pick up, pick would you would spend on, you spent on that. You exactly. spent on that. Yeah. So that is the advantage which this panel has over indigenous panels because there are many labs which are offering their own RNA, PCRs and all, and those I think are not reliable. But I really wish that if the cost would come down further, the use would really go up yeah. tremendously. So right okay, now... I, I think all of us agree, Pavan, Asif, yeah. we all agree that that if the cost... I think uh, the, if the, and the usage would be much, much more, yeah. right? So it would be yeah. a higher now consumption is, with a lower... It is already, it is a very popular taste for uh, most of the metro hospitals. So I will request rather uh, cost should be reduced. <laughs> Little bit. Okay, I don't want to embarrass Mr. Sachin more, <laughs> but I think one more valid uh, request uh, which came from Tanu Madam's uh, suggestion is that why aren't we involving some of the more pro common tropical diseases which can be? What is your take on it, Mr. Sachin? Particularly so, uh, dengue, when this bouncing back, yeah. we have so many so, dengue patients now coming in Mumbai. I think this is the same with Hyderabad and, and Kolkata also. Yeah. Yes, yes. 
so if you if you uh, if you actually look at the history of biofire we launched i mean in india in 2015 with uh, with two or three panels then we launched the emi panel and so on and then from then on every year we have been launching two panels and the same same trend will be continued and as you rightly said the tropical panel uh, uh, stds and all i mean there are there, there is a huge list of wish list that we have and our r and d is continuously working on it and uh, our uh, aim our whole objective is to get at least two panels every year so we just so we have, have to wait for dengue for a while right yes yes so um, there is this tropical fever panel which is from fast track diagnostics which picks up seven pathogens dengue leptospira chikungunya rickettsia west nile malaria and salmonella so you know if of course it pick up for leptospira and chikungunya is very good but not so much for the other pathogens so i wish for india if biofire would look at something because if they would if we would get a panel which picks up salmonella well it would really be useful because there is a yes, gap yes. as far as diagnosis of enteric fever is concerned because you i think we have to put a, we have to put a strong indian lobby to buy for your biomero itself right yes. so in, in that sense because india would be a huge market for a name. and if we can really price it along with india specific uh, your panel pathogen panel which madam is obviously the salmonella your the lepto and all other we are really bogged down with this thing and once covid settles down i think all those organisms will strike back again okay i will come to uh, uh, last one or two questions is that a uh, little bit and again it would be as madam was not there so we will bother her with that day. so do you think that the use of uh, the rapid diagnostics can be useful right and the question is very specific in de escalation in na or it is more of a decision making Rather, or ruling in rather than ruling out and stopping antibiotics, de-escalating antibiotics. I'm talking about on decisions on patients who had been for a while. Yes, so I think in that respect, the BCID panel is quite useful. Again, so basically, let me give you some examples. Like for example, you have a patient in the ICU and you've sent cultures from the central line and peripheral line. The patient is very sick, and the line flag saying GPC is there. Okay, so now you have two options: either you wait for twenty-four to forty-eight hours to find out what it is, or you run a BCID panel. So, if you run a BCID panel and you find that it is just Staph haemolyticus or Epidermidis, then you know that you don't need to give it's any contamination. Yeah, it's contamination, so, so you don't need to really start any anti-MRSA or anti-enterococcal antibiotic. Other thing is that suppose you have a uh, you have started empiric therapy, like let's say sick patient in the ICU. See who's been there, and now he's become sick. So you've started, let's say, polybixin, digicycline, phosphomycin, some kind of combination, which is empiric combination in most ICUs. Right. And your BCID, your blood culture flags gram negative. You ask for a BCID panel. If the right. BCID panel tells you it's Pseudomonas, obviously you will back off the digicycline, isn't right. it? If your BCID right. panel tells you that this is Acinetobacter, then you know you will back off the phosphomycin, and simultaneously the BCID panel will also tell you if they are resistance gene. So it will help in both optimizing therapy and this. So suppose if it tells you your BCID panel shows you E. coli and you don't have any of the resistance genes like NDM or OXA, then you know you can treat your patient with meropenem and you don't need to give polymyxin, etc. So in that respect, I think it helps because it. Maybe saves twenty four hours of antibiotic, extra antibiotic use because eventually your Vitec reports will come in after twenty four hours. So twenty four hours of antibiotic use is saved. But in that, the BCID panel, however, is a more helpful in optimizing therapy than in de-escalation. Okay, I got got your point, but it may not be helpful in the respiratory tract panel because of the colonization yes. and its inability to differentiate between. In fact, the, and as you told in, earlier that. Most of the patient, by the time you are sending, I'll already have had that colonization, and there would be a multiple organisms being reported. In fact, the respiratory panel, the lower respiratory panel, runs the risk of actually over treating the patient because right. what happens is patient has been there for two days. You send the lower respiratory panel; it will show you Acinetobacter, NDM gene, or whatever gene present, and then the, automatically the clinician will give polymyxin, right. whereas it may not be needed. so the, i feel that the lower respiratory panel actually may may cause you to use 
more antibiotics than what is really necessary for that patient. So un unless and until there is a uh, so very compelling reason to do so, I think lower uh, lower respiratory tract panel should be uh, restricted in, in certain way for yeah. patients who are staying for a while. But it's an excellent tool for uh, the initial phases when, when the patient has yeah. just So for example, if your patient comes with a severe community acquired pneumonia, yes. immediately gets intubated, the first sample you send, and if you grow a Klebsiella, if you identify a Klebsiella, or you identify an MRSA, then you know that this is the community acquired pneumonia due to those pathogens and you treat aggressively, but not in a patient who's been there. For I think the years. same, the, the same uh, logic applies for the stool cultures also. Good for the community patients who are coming to it, not for a patient who has stayed for a while, because mm -hmm. by the time the gut is already colonized. No, and no, the, that's the, the community, the, that panel, the stool panel is not really for nosocomial diarrhea. It's for community yes. onset diarrhea only. But uh, what I'm trying to say is sometimes you pick up three or four pathogens which don't right. really help you in your um, treatment. And because the cost of the test is more than the cost of the treatment, it costs a huge amount of money. So it's so mainly good for immunocompromised patients. Okay. So uh, I think, uh, and Madam, the last question we always wanted to know that, uh, 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 that the sensitivity and specificity of this say, right? So how come both are so pretty high? What, what's a good thing about its technical aspects? Uh, and, and whether this rapid diagnostic PCR or the PCR-based techniques are better than the other rapid diagnostics those are available? So again, we will have to um, look at it in terms of the specific panel. So if you look at the CSF or the meningoencephalitis panel, we know that the sensitivity for detection of bacterial pathogens is much better than latex agglutination, gram stain or culture combined for right. all the bacterial pathogens. Right. And right. we also know that picking up viral pathogens, this is the only method because we are not going to be doing viral culture. So it's the only method for that. So that is why the sensitivity and specificity of the ME panel is better than the other tests which are available, except for the cryptococcus. Then similarly, for the upper respiratory panel also, you don't have really other tests to pick up viruses because we know that the antigen detection tests in the upper respiratory secretions, whether it is for influenza is suboptimal than the PCR-based methods. So it is much better for these for, uh, much better than antigen for upper respiratory pathogens and for certain pathogens like mycoplasma, chlamydia and pertussis, it's the only method which is available. You don't have other methods. Right, and right. the and also like but for the uh, stool i i can't really say because in stool you actually have other methods also maybe you can um, like for example for uh, shigella you can do your cultures for your cryptosporidium you can do your um, you know immunofluorescence uh, your afb stain and for your uh, rotavirus and for your um, adenovirus, you have the antigen detection kit. So I feel that this, and for Clostridium difficile, you have a standalone PCR. Yeah. So if you ask me to rank the tests, all the five panels which are available, which we have talked about. In terms of utility, say, yeah. Utility, then I would say, in my perspective, the ME panel, the upper respiratory biofire, and the BCID panel are the most useful. In oh, do you agree practice. with this? Yeah, definitely. I think the first would always be the upper respiratory panel. Second would be BCID. Then CSF, yeah, definitely uh, where we are in a doubt in the CSF panel. Now, there are sub subset, like I said, the community aqua, also common pneumonias. Definitely, you have to look into that. That's what I said. Clinical judgment is important rather than just looking at that and reflexively treating it. Whatever we have grown mm -hmm. on it. Yeah, what you are okay. growing, whether it is uh, valid in that particular situation. So it is important for it to give you an idea of where you are heading and what's growing in. Like I said, definitely not uh, before your XDR hits. After XDR, your your especially patients who are seeing COVID patients after uh, they are on ventilator for 30 days. Patients you are treating already polymic, post polymix in what is it growing? And the patient is actually developing pneumonia. You know that there is a worsening of oxygen, worsening of things going on, and you suspect the next level of infection where the escape organism beyond that which are escaping polymyxin and meropenum. That's where you're looking for. So to pick up those heresias and other things, burkhold areas, it helps you out if you if it shows up on your thing. But, you know, in nosocomial so, pneumonia, I just want to make a point, your culture also yes, moves these pathogens. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. You send both of them. The idea is not to only rely on this, but to send both of them. It's always a thing where you send both of them. They will not come to a point where we send only this test, uh, unless it is, like we say, it's only a respiratory. We know it's short, short respiratory. You just want to pinpoint which respiratory virus it is. That's the only reason where you send alone. So, okay, I think we have uh, almost on the time to uh, wrap it up. So I would request Asif to give your closing remarks. And yeah. you may say so, about... Uh, Regarding and summarize the, it, it nicely. Yeah. Regarding the uh, syndromic test, upper respiratory is very useful for initial test. And uh, I will uh, uh, comment only one thing in the, regarding the GI panel. Uh, we have seen a lot of cases when we send the uh, CD toxin, uh, we get a negative report. But in panel, we found that uh, positive. We uh, definitely we uh, it is very helpful to identification CD earlier rather uh, do test uh, one day, two day, three days toxin and you are getting negative no. when you, there is a uh, strong suspicious. No, but uh, I just want to say this that you can get a C diff toxigenic PCR positive on the panel without having C diff disease. So what we generally do is that. We do that if the CDF PCR comes positive, we also do a toxin assay for the patient. Yes. So if the assay is also the toxin assay is also positive, then that unequivocally then establishes infection. that the patient has CDF. But only if the PCR is positive, the toxin is negative, then you have to go by the clinical presentation and then make a decision about whether you so want we to treat usually the patient. Fact if we send the toxin first. But uh, sometime, uh, one of two cases in my ICU that uh, there is a strong suspicion, but uh, yes. the CD is, uh, toxin is negative. Negative. But because the sensitivity of the toxin it, is smaller. As Madam yes, was sir. telling, yeah, as Madam was telling, so that is the major reason that why uh, this panel is not used for CD identification because hmm. it's always difficult. So your first line should be the toxin. If you yeah. get it incidentally for other reasons, you have used it, you got a CD. You have to reconfirm it by doing the toxin yeah. test. Yes. So, the very, is so this test is very useful for ruling out C diff. And you know, you have a standalone C diff PCR. So if you're suspecting it's a more CDF, negative predictive value, if negative it is negative, predictive value no is high. If yeah. your PCR yeah. is negative, it virtually rules out C diff. But rules if out, the PCR yeah. is positive, then you do a toxin also. And if toxin is also positive, then you can be very sure that your patient has C diff disease. If the toxin is negative, then you have to see whether there are any other causes and you may still treat the patient. So it has very good negative predictive value. Pawan, your uh, conclusive remark about usefulness in ICU setting. Regarding the stool sample or the regular one? No, no, overall. Conclusive remark about... Overall, definitely. Uh, we, have, we, have been, we have been discussing for the past one and a half hour, I think, uh, about yes. the uses more than limitations. Definitely, I think they have marketed as a genetic test because it is labeled as genetic test. So there's a lot of reimbursement issues come in, insurances don't cover it. At the moment, I think they should uh, take the label out of a genetic test and use it as an infectious disease uh, test or a microbiological test. I think then the um, then all the insurance companies will give a go for it. So uh, other the question that, of reimbursement actually do come into play that many of hmm. the this test is not reimbursed. Okay, so madam, your, your final comment, I would say what is good in it and what could be better in future? So I think it's good that we have these tests, but clinicians should know when they should send the tests. That is very important because we shouldn't be burdening our patients with the cost of the test when the result of the test is not likely to alter any decision making. Because right. these are expensive tests. So that is one important thing that we should know which patient to send the test. And then secondly, once you get the results, you have to be able to interpret the results very carefully in light of the clinical situation. So as to de decide what treatment you're going to offer. So you have to know when to send the test, when not to send the test. And once the results come back, how to interpret the results also. So that you know you don't end up like in the lower respiratory panel treating colonizers like in the GI panel, treating three or four pathogens together. Those things you have to be careful about. So people should learn when to send and when not to send. And what could be better uh, about it in future? So better about it could be 
that one, if the costs could come down, because the use will get def definitely go up and the volumes will make up for the decreased cost, you know, that is one thing. And second is that if we could have a tropical fever panel for India, you know, that would really help because we know that uh, Biomiru is a, you know, it's a class in itself. Their uh, tests are very well validated. They're very accurate. So it would help if we would have a tropical fever panel from them. So that would uh, boost our confidence in it, rather than taking some of the not so that validated tests on it. So Sachinji, uh, I think you have taken note from most of yes. our clinicians wish list, right? And we would try to push it for an India panel, India-based panel and a tropical panel for that. Okay, so right. thanking you all the panelists for being with us. Uh, especially Pavan and Asif for staying throughout. And thanks, Madam, more because you have taken time from another uh, program and come out, come come here. So we'll meet soon. I, we have just begun with Biomero and it is our intent to spread proper uh, uh, validated, I would say, and uh, knowledge in an ethical way to all, all the people. So it's just a beginning, but we would be back for more. Thank you. Thank Good you. night. Thank Have a nice Thank weekend. You. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Pavanji. Thank you, Asif. Thank you. And Sanchinji also. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.